Hi, this is Nan Cohen with Light Productions. And we're in Missoula at the Missoula Public Library. This is S Sustainability Month at the library. And today we have sustainability transportation as the subject. Bob Giordano and Phil Smith are the speakers today. So here we have sustainable transportation. Welcome to everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Betty Wing from the Missoula Public Library. We're just really glad to have you here. We're going to be talking about sustainable transportation this afternoon. And when we're done, I um, welcome you all to come up and look at some of our book displays and, and other displays that we have around. We're happy to be doing all this with the Sustainability Alliance. And I will turn this over to Mike Castudia, which runs the Alliance. Well, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you all here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Studia, and I work with the National Center for Appropriate Technology. And we're one of the founding members of the Sustainability Alliance of Western Montana. And if you're at all interested in that, there's literature about it in the back. Uh, this event is it's co-sponsored by the Alliance and the Sustainable Business Council. They have a meeting coming up this Wednesday that you might want to take in. Steve Loken will be talking about green buildings. Today's topic, though, is sustainable transportation, and we have two speakers, Bob Giordano and Phil Smith. <coughs> Bob is the director of the Missoula Institute for Sustainable Trans Transportation. He's the coordinator of Free Cycles Missoula. He served on numerous boards and panels, uh, <coughs> uh, including the Non-Motorized Transportation Steering Committee, He's currently on the Montana Department of Transportation's Committee for Redesigning Montana Highways. Phil Smith is with the, is the Bike Pedestrian Program Manager for the City of Missoula. Bob's going to speak first and then turn it over to Phil. And I'm going to turn it over to Bob right now. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just speak for about 25 minutes, then Phil can go, and then we can have some interactive discussion. So that's part of my passion with transportation is engaging with people and figuring out um, collective solutions to our collective problems in Missoula. Um, the project I'm with now, Missoula Institute for Sustainable Transportation, our mission, I want to give you a little background, is to work with communities to help build sustainable transportation systems. Sustainability, a, a little bit on the definition. I've been studying what is sustainability, how can it apply to a community. And a talk I heard a couple weeks ago by Lil Erickson of the Corporation for the Northern Rockies, she defined it as a process, a journey, not necessarily an endpoint or a product. Um, she also said that a hundred countries had agreed that sustainability was about meeting today's needs without compromising the needs of people in the future. Um, I do want to read a quote out of this book, Creating Sustainable Cities. Here's how Herbert Gerdet defines a sustainable city. A sustainable city is organized so as to enable all its citizens to meet their own needs and to enhance their well-being without damaging the natural world or endanger endangering the living conditions of other people now or in the future. Lil Erickson also cited three legs of sustainability, community well-being, environmental integrity, and economic prosperity. It seems to be how do we get all these things to work together. So sustainable concepts, applying them to transportation, uh, we might say sustainable transportation, it's a system of movement that's safe, it's efficient, it's cost effective, it's environmentally sound, and it's fair. It pays attention to the landscape and the culture, and also today and tomorrow, and also honors the past. In Missoula, we have a, a long history of transportation and streets and horses and trolley cars and bicycles, and how do we remember the past as we move forward into the future? So that, in a nutshell, that's the, the mission of MIST, is to work with communities to help develop sustainable systems. And how does that relate to all the other systems of a community, food systems, energy, shelter, and so forth? We have three main objectives to meet that broad mission. It's to define and promote principles of sustainable transportation, and that's going to be ongoing. We all need to work on what are the principles, what are our values. Also, improving transportation options is the second one, and finally, to look for optimal designs of streets. And so the city of Missoula is rewriting our 20-year transportation plan uh, right now. It started about two months ago, and the process will be done this fall. A new plan will be adopted. So the more people 
that engage in the conversation and, and we all work towards what are common solutions, um, the better off Missoula will be in the long term. We have some strategies to meet those objectives and that mission. And it's, it's doing this, it's engaging with the community, it's tours of our transportation system, it's looking at new models, it's research, design, it's monitoring, it's also doing demonstration projects. We've built two roundabouts in the last couple of months um, in a parking lot and just to get people to, to say, is this a tool for Missoula? What are the, what are the parts of a roundabout um, that make it work? What might not make it work for Missoula? So, actually building projects and working with the city and the citizens to all find common ground solutions. Some of their goals, why are we doing this? Reduce or even eliminate accidents or crashes. Reduce pollution. Make it a fair system. All modes count. How do we get rid of discrimination, even in our transportation system? Can we keep our habitats and our communities connected? Those are some of the goals, the, kind of the why. Well, today in Missoula, there's 1.5 million miles traveled by automobile every day uh, in this valley. We have a closed air shed. We have pollution problems. I live close to the Madison Street Bridge, and I still remember an article from the Missoulian a year and a half ago. It talked about benzene levels at the south end of the Madison Street Bridge being 13 times higher than the EPA's cancer risk level. So as, we're, as we want to continue living in Missoula, and even our young ones are thinking about families and how can we keep this livable while meeting those mobility needs, the economic balance, the economics, the environment, the community well-being. Um, there's 20, 000, a few more indicators of Missoula and why do we need to look to new models and new ways. I, just, I mentioned an air pollution stat. Uh, there's approximately one to 2,000 crashes in Missoula a year between, between modes. It might be a car, 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 bike, car, pedestrian, even bike, pedestrian. There's a, it's hard to get a grasp on the exact numbers, but somewhere around 1,000 to 2,000, um, six, maybe about six a day. There's 20,000 cars that come in from the Bitterroot Valley every morning into the Missoula Valley, and that affects Missoula and how we then design our streets. I want to show you two, two of these diagrams that talk about how we sort of got to this point. For the past 50 years, a lot of transportation planning has been based on the automobile. It says, for instance, 2002 today, a street like Russell Street, R Russell Third, I'm on a citizen advisory committee representing a group called Missoula Trails Group. And what we're being told is that we have to look at a project that meets a 20 year need. So we have to build a Russell and Third Street today that meets the, the projections for 20 years from now. On the surface, that makes a lot of sense. Let's build something that doesn't become obsolete but there are some flaws with that and we need to address them as a community because the primary way is to take the trends from the past 10 years and just project, project them out 20 years. So there's a lot of assumptions in that, that we're gonna keep, we're gonna continue down this line of um, increasing vehicle miles traveled and we're at 1.5 million miles a day in the Missoula Valley. So the computer projections do not do a good job of taking in changing values or maybe what does the whole community want? How do you balance pedestrians? Uh, bicyclists, transit, driving. So this is one, one model and traditionally we have widened roads from two to four lanes when it hits 12,000 cars a day. So if we're here at 2002, say we're in this, say 8,000 cars a day, you project out 20 years and if, if it comes out to be say 24, 25,000 cars a day, that's the trigger. That says we need four lanes now to accommodate for a 20 year projection. There's another principle that I'd like to, for everyone to be aware of, because Missoula is going to have to face this in our 20-year plan. It's called level of service. G roads are graded from A to F. And for the past 50 years, the goal has been to get as high a level of service as possible. as close to A, free flow with low volumes and high speeds. As you get a lower level of service, it gets down to, say, E, unstable flow, maybe short stoppages. So in the past, a value like children crossing a street to get to a school. If we have, um, say, a stoplight to get kids across or a pedestrian crossing, that can, go, that can actually cause stoppages that then s trigger to the engineers that we're not meeting a high, a, level of, a high level of service. 
it's even it's usually even in, in the books as a standard where it might be the standard for Montana roads would be B or C. And today um, in Missoula and Montana, the standards are about B, but uh, Montana Dar Department of Transportation, they will accept C on roads. But what other communities are saying is maybe D and E are acceptable, or even F at certain peak times of the day. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to plan a road around a 20-year projection for a rush hour and for the largest vehicles possible. So it, it, we end up supersizing everything. And when you do go from two lanes to four lanes, it makes it harder to walk and bike. It's a concept called induced demand. So we almost start this spiral effect where we go to four lanes, maybe we, we bring down 50 houses and we pay the owners and they move further out. Um, it becomes a little less desirable to, to walk, bike, or take transit. So we have to figure out, as a community, ways to address this spiraling effect of just accommodating more and projected vehicle miles traveled. So these are two concepts, level of service, and this is actually even measured with numbers where um, A is average delay of less than five seconds per <coughs> car, B is five to 15 seconds per car, C is 15 to 25, on down to like E is 60 seconds or less, and then F is greater than 60 seconds. So I was thinking about this recently, and we could have a situation where one pedestrian crossing a road causes a delay of a vehicle that then gets calculated into these models and puts us over a threshold where um, it triggers a road widening from, say, two to four lanes. I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining that, but it is it could be that specific where one crossing, one person's decision, we go to now four lanes or five lanes. These are things we have to work through in the Missoula community. So I want to, I want to show some slides, um, about 15 slides, and then I'm going to show a few more diagrams, and I'm going to focus mainly on some of the ideas um, of street design, things we could do differently in Missoula. That's one of the three objectives of MIST. Let me, before I do the slides, let me touch on one other objective that I'm not going to talk a whole lot more about, and that is the improving transportation options. Bike share, like the yellow bikes on campus, perhaps we can do more of those around town, especially if we did specialty um, bicycle like trailers. Maybe we don't need to own a bike trailer, but if you could walk to your neighborhood, maybe in conjunction with the mud tool library, libraries like this. Um, so bike share, car share, it's a principle um, that's coming out of Europe. Switzerland is doing a lot of car share, where if you don't drive too often, maybe you belong into a car share club. And for a couple hours a week, you check out a, a car for, say, 10 or $15 for those couple hours. You can save a lot on the fixed costs. The bus service, we have Mountain Line, it's getting better. Uh, the mayor of Boulder came a few weeks ago and talked about their bus service and how they, you don't even need a schedule, you step out on an arterial and within say seven minutes, seven to ten minutes, here comes a bus. They name their bus lines the hop, the skip, the jump. They're adding the dash and the stampede. There's music on the buses. Um, they're making it a fun part of the community and 60,000 out of the 100,000 people have bus passes. A lot of that ties back to smart growth and how are our densities and how are we growing as a community. There's some thresholds that make transit really work. So that's another thing we need to make sure is transit and land use, transportation and land use work well together. And let's pay attention to where are those thresholds. If we're just below a threshold where transit can become amazing and work well, maybe we should at least work <clears throat> towards that threshold of certain density, certain dwelling number of dwelling units per acre on a scale the size of Missoula. So bike share, car share, bus service, and even getting the train back. There's a group working towards getting an Amtrak route back through Missoula. That route ended 20 years ago, but Spokane to Denver would be the Amtrak route, and it could co come through the depot downtown. And then a lot of people like to see light rail, say, in the Bitterroot Valley, and that's going to take a lot of effort. There's a lot of costs, but when you compare them to just widening highways, there's a lot of benefits to, to rail versus widening highways further. Turn the lights down just for a second. So it's been a. Maybe leave a back one on, please. No. Or is, I was hoping it worked that way, but I think it's happened. Okay. This is Grenoble, France. You want this one? You can keep it off. Grenoble, France, about um, 200,000 people surrounded by mountains. They have air quality problems. 
Their transit is, they, they build it the first fully accessible, handicap accessible transit, all flap folds down when um, wheelchairs need to get on, it works well for strollers. How we integrate different modes of transportation needs to be an issue we discuss. It's a different way of doing a bikeway. We have bike lanes being developed here, but there's instances where a cycle track or a separated bikeway um, might work in Missoula, where it's the walkway, the bikeway, then the parked cars, and then the motorway. Rearranging our, our physical space. This is still in Grenoble where you can see it used to be a, a left-hand turn and they're, they're converting some motorized space to non-motorized uses. That's a speed table as opposed to a speed bump and it connects the pedestrian ways. Um, it sends a signal that uh, the pedestrian matters in the, in the built environment and it keeps traffic, uh, motorized traffic speeds lower, especially around schools and higher density pedestrian areas. Um, we've got the Prius in the inside out here. This is gonna be, a, a, it seems like a key, moving towards alternative vehicles, al alternative fuels, biodiesel fuel made from spent fryer oil. The park and ride on campus is running on 100% biodiesel, but we also have to pay attention. We don't wanna convert all our ag land crops to fuel for mobility instead of fuel for few, uh, instead of instead of food production. So combining car share and alternative fuels, we can change our transportation system in a way that might work with the landscape and the communities better. Just designating the bike zone a little clearer, especially in a tight spot. And that we're now in Geneva, Switzerland. The little white bar that's a, it's called the stop bar for the bicycle lane, you can see it's ahead of the car lane. It gives better vis visibility to the bicyclist, and it also um, puts you, the bicyclist in a zone where there might not be as, not, as much pollution that's um, coming from the car exhaust. This is in Copenhagen, just a way of separating bicycling and um, motorized traffic, especially on a busy road. This is where the separation seems to be used in Europe, is on higher speed roads and higher volume roads. So we need that discussion more in Missoula. Integrating bicycle parking into the landscape and having a cover. The sign here just doesn't have a, just doesn't denote a bicycle system, but it has destinations and distances. Helps kind of create a sense of place within a community. That was in Norway. Now we're back in Missoula. There used to be driving and parking on the Oval until 1955. A lot of people don't realize that. So we do undergo changes in our city, on our campuses, and we shouldn't forget those changes, and we shouldn't forget that we can make other changes. Um, Julius Caesar had to limit the amount of chariots in the city center. It got way too congested a long time ago. You can imagine that the parking could just as easily be up to the curb, the yellow curb on the right, and that the walking and biking was through the parking lot. But by rearranging a little different, it gives a different feel to the area and allows all modes to, to kind of reach their potential. We have bike lanes, but we gotta to work towards better, better maintaining the bike lanes. And it's hard because it, it takes a lot of money. This is bicycling or kind of the view of a cyclist coming into downtown. And I show this more for the opportunity because as I showed some of the graphs before, we unnecessarily have wide roads in Missoula. We don't need four and five lanes in a lot of instances. So what are we gonna do with the extra space if we do go down to say two lanes or three lanes? We need to look for opportunities to put in more trails and connect the trail system, but make sure we work with the, the landowners and businesses in an area so that it fits. The connections of the pedestrian system. The city has a good program where they're working on more sidewalks and curb cuts and making a, a seamless transportation system. And small innovations can matter. I think the stat I've heard is we have about six parking spaces in Missoula for every car, which is typical of the whole United States. Um, that ends up being a lot of pavement. So if we can do things that can reduce the amount of 
impervious surface, it also helps with our, our 